until December of last year, um, it was quite commonly believed, and, and that included myself, that the second round would be Yulia Tymoshenko versus Petro Poroshenko. So, in effect, a repeat of 2014, except then it didn't go to a second round. Um, what happened in December, January, was that the dynamics of the election changed, and not everybody could see it at the time. Uh, Tymoshenko began to decline, um, which was, I think, very disappointing for her because she had begun the campaign first. She put in probably a huge amount of resources, maybe second to Poroshenko. Um, and um, she invested a lot in sort of kind of new programmatic materials, although, to be quite honest, most people didn't quite understand uh, what she was trying to promote. Um, so she began to decline. Poroshenko began to go up. Um, partly, people were saying in response to the uh, receipt of uh, autocephaly for the Ukrainian Orthodox Church in December. And then a new boy on the block began to grow, particularly in January. So that's when you move from a two-candidate dynamic to a three-candidate dynamic. And then from January onwards, Zelenko began to grow um, and to therefore take the heat, take away um, much of the votes from other anti-establishment populists and candidates such as Anatoly Gritsenko and Yuli Tymoshenko. So um, throughout this, this last three months, Zelensky has been a virtual candidate. Um, he's basically crystallized around him a, a very wide variety of people, ranging from Zakarpatia in western Ukraine all the way through to eastern and southern Ukraine. Um, so they all have different views of what, who or what is, is Volodymyr Zelensky. Um, but one thing that they all agree on is that he is the anti-establishment candidate, he is the Brexit candidate, um, he is the candidate who um, is basically saying a plague on all of your houses. So I think what we should understand is that a vote for Zelensky in the first round and support for him prior to that wasn't just an anti-Poroshenko vote or, or support. It was, it, was, um, it was hostility to all of the previous candidates because all of them, Gritsenko and Timoshenko, for example, were running... Um, their third campaigns, so they were they were establishment candidates as well. Um, Anat Anatoly Sadove dropped out, but he was the mayor of Lviv, and Yuri Boyko in particular was an establishment candidate. So it wasn't just this wasn't just a Poroshenko attack; it was an attack against a plague on all of the houses. And maybe one of the problems was that this campaign did not offer any new faces, real new faces. Uh, Sviatoslav Vakorchuk, the lead singer of, of um, the um, well-known well -known band um, in Ukraine, um, he was going to stand, but then he, at the last moment, dropped out. Um, so, in many ways, Zelensky took up the, the space in the campaign that would have been Vakorchuk's if he had stood. Um, but, of course, Vakorchuk's a very different... Um, I think a uh, person to Zelensky, Zekvakarchuk, is somebody who has a PhD and who has um, been abroad at various universities as a visiting scholar, besides being a, a well-known rock star. So um, this, what happened um, as well, which is similar in some ways to the 2016 US elections and in some ways the Brexit campaign in Britain in that same year, is that the final result was something that everybody was shocked with. Uh, nobody expected Donald Trump to win 2016. There must have been countless occasions during the election campaign when people said, this is it, he said something stupid again, or some new compromat on Trump came out, and that means that Trump's campaign's over, but it was never over. He was a Teflon candidate in many ways, so opposition to the establishment was had greater roots than anything that could be thrown at Trump, as it were, or anything stupid that he could say. 
And in that, and in that way, that was similar with Zelensky. I mean, he hasn't got a clean slate. Um, he's received Russian government grants until about 2017. He had Russian businesses going right up until the election campaign. Um, you could say that about Poroshenko, but no, Poroshenko's businesses were either taken over by Russia or he had to close them down right at the beginning of the war. Um, and also, um, you know, if Poroshenko's got property abroad, so has Zelensky, which he forgot to declare on his tax return. So um, there are many things that were starting to come out of the closet, particularly as Ukrainian journalists began to dig deeper and found some very troubling and very close uh, relationships between um, Zelensky and oligarch Igor Kolomoisky. Um, this didn't, didn't seem to trouble many people at the time, maybe because they didn't understand it, or maybe because he kept denying it. But Zelensky's well-known show, Servant of the People, now in its third series, um, is aired on One Plus One channel, which is owned by Kolomoisky. Kolomoisky has been in open warfare with Poroshenko for the last four years, um, basically over three issues, um, because Poroshenko has closed down three corrupt um, areas of income that, Poros that uh, Kolomoisky used to have. Firstly, this was the nationalization of Privat Bank uh, in 2016, through which about five and a half billion dollars had been money laundered, um, according to various Western investigations. Uh, secondly, it was a state oil refining company, Ukrnafta, which Kolomoisky managed to control for about a decade and to basically skim off um, profits and such like. And thirdly, Ukraine International Air Airlines, he, he had the monopoly control over Ukraine's European flights, um, but that was squeezed out, that airline was squeezed out by the coming into Ukraine of discount airlines such as Ryanair, Wizz Air, EasyJet, and more and more of those are coming in this year. And that's very important, particularly for younger people who want to use the opportunity of visa-free travel to Europe to buy cheap tickets. So Kolomoisky obviously has an agenda. There's no such, no such thing as a free lunch in Ukraine. The idea that he would just because he wants to support a new candidate, support Zelensky, and not expect anything in return, is, is ludicrous and naive, friendly to believe that. So certainly, those three areas, Privat Bank, Ukrnafta, and Ukraine International Airlines, would be, some, would be areas that Kolomoisky would be seeking to get back um, his position in if Zelensky were to win. Now, Zelensky, of course, is denying this, but um, um, and there would certainly wouldn't be so easy for him to do this because Ukraine isn't a presidential system. He can't issue a decree as a president of Ukraine and give Privat Bank back to Kolomoisky. That has to be done by the government, and the government in turn is controlled by parliament. So we are coming into the second round um, on Sunday. Um, Zelensky still is a virtual candidate, which again makes his um, pres presidential campaign rather strange. Um, he's, he, you know, there are similarities to Donald Trump, um, but there are many, many dissimilarities, far more. Trump um, was a long-term um, um, political, had long-term political involvement in the Republican Party, and his views on immigration, on economic nationalism, protectionism, were long-standing. So he stands for something, and he, 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 he describes himself as, a, as an American nationalist, and his campaign is make America great again, put America first. So Zelensky is none of that. We actually don't know what Zelensky stands for. Um, and, um, and Trump, um, yes, they both come from show business, but Trump has zero problem as a narcissist in uh, standing in front of a camera. He loves cameras, he loves being a showman. Um, he's not afraid of debating even tough, tough uh, people like Hillary Clinton. Um, obviously Zelensky is. Um, and we, so we have, we've had a farcical situation where Zelensky thought he could win 
win one by uh, throwing the gauntlet down and asking Poroshenko to debate him in the Olympic Stadium. Poroshenko accepted. Then Zelensky never showed up. Um, if Poroshenko debated himself or, or was asked questions by journalists. And then we still don't know if there are going to be any debates um, prior to Sunday's um, election. There may be one just a couple of days before election day. Um, but certainly there's no question that Zelensky is afraid for many reasons. Firstly, he's inexperienced in politics, that's obvious, and in particular in international relations, um, which is dangerous at a time of war with Russia when, when he's not only president, he's also commander-in-chief. Um, but, more, but also for, for many Ukrainians, which this will be important, that he doesn't speak Ukrainian. He's the first Ukrainian uh, presidential candidate who doesn't speak Ukrainian. So he's even worse than Viktor Yanukovych. Viktor Yanukovych learned Ukrainian uh, during the election campaign. Uh, when Zelensky begins speaking Ukrainian, he obviously gets um, a bit of a complex and he switches back to Russian straight away. Um, and his program, particularly the third series of Servant of, of the People, you can find it on the One Plus One channel, has many derogatory remarks about uh, Ukraine identity and Ukraine language. Um, um, so there are specific areas of problem. Now, Zelensky is falling into the same trap as other candidates like Timoshenko and said what he's going to do in the first 100 days. Well, he could... These candidates can say what they want, but Ukraine's not a presidential system. Ukraine's a parliamentary system or a very badly dis uh, organized uh, hybrid system. It's not fully parliamentary, it's not fully presidential. But certainly, parliament and government are very, very important, unlike in, say, Russia, Belarus, Azerbaijan, and elsewhere. Which means that Zelensky can't do anything if he's elected for the first 200 days, then the mind 100 days. Um, because the same parliamentary coalition, the same deputies, and the same government, i.e. Poroshenko's government, will be in place until October when you have parliamentary elections. So for the, at least the first 200 days, Zelensky won't really have much power. And then you're in a situation as what will parliament do in this situation? Will it try to whittle down Zelensky's powers even more? Will it move to a fully parliamentary system where Zelensky's powers is reduced? But a president in Ukraine's system only has power in three or four areas. He appoints the Secretary of the National Security and Defense Council. He um, is in charge of the Ministry of Defense, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the, the Prosecutor's Office. That's it. But even the candidates for those last three, Minister of Defense, Minister of Foreign Affairs, and the General Prosecutor, these candidates have to be proposed to Parliament and they have to be voted on. Um, everything else um, is the purview, is under the responsibility of the government. Um, unfortunately, Ukraine's presidential candidates and Ukrainian voters seem to think that everything stands at the, at the doorstep of the president. I, if I have bad plumbing in my house, it's the fault of the president. Um, a very Soviet mentality. In fact, no. The Ukrainian president has very limited power, and um, he, his power is, is, is dependent on having political representation in parliament. Zelensky will only have a political representation in parliament um, in October. Yes, there's a small faction which is loyal to um, Kolomoisky, about, called Vidrodzhenia, it's about 20 deputies. But you're not going to do much with 20 deputies. So, um, yes, he's, he's now planning on creating a new political party. But that political party, Servant of the People, is supposed to be called, will not get more than, uh, one could imagine, 50, 60, 70 um, deputies. Um, the Popular Front, Narodny Front, um, led by Arsen Yatsenyuk, was created very quickly in 2014 and won 80 seats. So that could be the maximum it would um, receive. If that's the case, then, then Zelensky's party in Parliament from October will have to go into a coalition with other parties. Now, if it's the largest one in that coalition, 
then it could demand positions like the prime ministership. But if it's not the largest, then he can't make demands. Then the largest faction, say Poroshenko's or somebody else's, they will say, well, we're the largest and we should have the prime minister's position. So this is all dependent on what happens in the October elections. Um, and then once a coalition is created, which is Zelensky's party plus other people, uh, then that coalition creates the government. It's not the president that creates the government. Importantly here, Zelensky in October, once those elections happen, will have to decide who he goes into coalition with. And there are only three possibilities. There are pro-reform parties, parties in the, who in the last five years voted for reforms, and these include Narodny Front, loyal to Yatsenyuk, Poroshenko Bloc, and Samopomich, self-reliance, um, headed by Lviv Mayor Sadovey. So will he go into bed with those? The second group are the populists, Timoshenko, Batkivshina, and the Radical Party. Will he go into bed with those? Well, if you go into bed with, with Timoshenko, you can't really describe yourself as a new face anymore. Um, and you can't um, claim, as you are claiming at the moment, that you will continue to work with the IMF on Ukraine, because Timoshenko is very hostile to the IMF. And the third group will be pro-Russian um, political forces, but they only have 40 deputies at the moment. So they're not exactly going to be a large group of people. Um, that's something in the past. And if you align with those, you would create massive destabilization in Ukraine. So to conclude on this point, um, Zelensky's uh, election um, has potentially a number of dangers because it brings to power, um, um, say, Kolomoisky and oligarchs. One of the big ironies of this election campaign is that the majority of Ukraine's oligarchs are aligned against Poroshenko, not for him. Um, a, a, study put, a study produced last week by a Ukrainian think tank found that something like three quarters of Ukrainian television was hostile to Poroshenko and only 20% hostile to Zelensky. So because Ukrainian TV is controlled by Ukrainian oligarchs, they have poured dirt on Poroshenko for the last three or four years. This aspect of the election campaign is being totally ignored by the Western media. We're focused on Poroshenko as the oligarch. And when in fact oligarchs have been hostile to, um, to Poroshenko. So yes, there's a danger he brings Kolomoisky to power, back to power, and he's greedy. I mean, um, his, his only interest really is in money. Um, but let's not, not forget that uh, Ukraine is a parliamentary system, so it's not a presidential system where winners take all, and he, and he won't be able to change the constitution. Um, secondly, the constitution already includes NATO and EU membership as Ukraine's goals, so Zelensky won't be able to change that. He won't be able to get the 300 votes. Um, thirdly, he won't have much power between uh, April and October elections, and even up to November by the time the parliament is created, uh, because it will be the same parliament and same government in those um, seven months or so. And finally, um, he will have to go into coalition with somebody else. And so inevitably that, that means uh, horse trading, it means negotiations, it means compromise. Um, importantly, final factors are that Ukraine is not Russia. Ukraine is not the former USSR. And here, here is where I don't think people like Zelensky and Kolomoisky quite understand this. Ukraine has a very vibrant civil society. It has a very large number of veterans from the war, um, and it has um, a vocal street manifestation of Ukrainian nationalism. Um, they don't win votes in election campaigns. The, the nationalist candidate won less than 2%, Koshalinsky. But they do have street presence. Many of them are ex-veterans as well. So even if um, some Zelensky was trying to sort of do some, some deal with Russia, or some deal with the separatist regions, um, it would be very difficult for him to get, get it through. There would be simply too, too much opposition. And a warning signal of this was four, four years ago when you had riots outside the Ukrainian parliament and three National Guardsmen were killed by grenades. So 
Um, I think there's a potential danger of instability from Zelensky, from his political inexperience, from his naivety about Russia, um, and because um, um, he doesn't really have any political presence in Parliament. So potentially there's a, there's a, a danger of going back to the Yushchenko era of, of squabbling between the president, prime minister, and government and parliament. It's a potential for that, but which is dangerous at the time of war. But, but the idea that Zelensky somehow gets everything he wants if he's elected into power is very unlikely. Um, on that, I'll finish. Thank you.